Okay, so as I said, I finished my PhD at the University of Southampton. I was a collaborative doctoral award student um, at that, with, uh, and I, through that I was twinned with the National Trust on a project called Lived Experience at Bodium, Scotney and Item in the Later Middle Ages. This project um, kind of came about from a number of ways, and the whole point was it was meant to be collaborative, engaging new technologies in asking questions. I think when they set up this project, they broadly envisioned me just creating a whole series of like beautiful 3D models and beautifully photorealistic images ready for their, their National Trust guidebooks and things. Um, and I haven't really thought about how they, like, what else they might get out of that. Um, I ended up taking a project in a slightly different direction because I was quite interested in how we can move towards a multi-sensory engagement or what other sensory kind of things we could engage with beyond just what we see at a site, whether that be what we see in the remains now or what's standing or what people in the past might have seen. So um, I got onto the subject of oralisation. Um, when I first started this project, I guess I'd kind of come at this from a master's at Southampton as well, where I'd focused on spatial technology. So I was very much a GIS kind of person. Um, and I'd kind of used network analysis a bit in my undergraduate. And you've kind of done lots of bits and pieces. And I kind of, this is actually stolen from a previous tag session I ran with Sarah Perry and Gareth Beale um, on seeing, thinking and doing and different ways of engaging again with digital technologies and um, what other people are doing. Um, but it's all like different visual, very, very visual approaches to um, the past, particularly using digital techniques. Um, and as I started kind of looking into this, I realised there's actually a really kind of heavy theoretical bend to all this. And these are a whole series of quotes that I stick into pretty much every presentation I give. Purely because it's, it's interesting that we've put out for this session, and I've, I've run a few similar sessions, and it's actually really hard to get people to produce papers that are engaging in more multi-sensory elements of the past, or people who are willing to come and talk about them. Um, and some of these quotes are kind of like why people don't engage with more multi-sensory things, and some of them are like why we should, to some extent. Um, either way, lots of people are doing lots of exciting things, and that's kind of where sensory archaeology is at the moment, and I think it's particularly being approached in a number of different ways. Um, more often than not, especially in the digital realms, it's often like a computer scientist, or in my case, an acoustician, twins up with an archaeologist, and not much kind of cross-communication between the two. They've just kind of got this idea of what they want to see emerge from it. Um, building acoustics. So I came, when I was doing my PhD, I sat on in a couple of units at the Institute of Sound and Vibration Studies in Southampton. Um, and I sat a unit of building acoustics there. And this is um, how engineers kind of look at um, modelling spaces to some extent. Um, when I started, I thought, oh, there must be a technology which does this. And I'm sure it'll work in exactly the same way as visualisation. You know, it'll be there because I, I know that people have been like designing buildings according to what people would hear in those spaces before they build them. So presumably the technique must be there and it must be quite refined. There's no reason why we can't just use the same te technique in, that people use to design spaces as we've done in visualisation uh, and go the other way and, you know, I'm not going to use the word reconstruct. Uh, consider those options anyway. Um, so it all started with Professor Wallace Sabine in, I think he's at Harvard, um, and he was a physicist, I think, and he was asked to mend the acoustics of this lecture theatre. Um, basically, uh, as you might have noticed, I'm going to use an example from the conference in the last few days, uh, when we had the opening speech at the icebreak party, um, no one could really hear what was going on, and that's because that space was not designed for public speaking. Uh, the projection of the sound doesn't work. This room is a remarkably good example of a lecture theatre, as I'm not mic'd up, but you can all hear me, I think, from the back quite well. But my words aren't slurring together too much. There's not too much um, like uh, echoes and too many vibrations continuing through the sound. Um, whereas a lot of the other spaces, you'll notice that people are mic'd, and as soon as they move away from the microphone, you can't hear what they're saying. Part of this is to do with the rearrangement of the room, because um, the space where the podiums have been moved around in some of the spaces. Anyway, uh, he was asked to mend the acoustics of the space, and um, he basically used, uh, he kind of defined something called, uh, what's it called, reverberation? Oh, yeah, reverberation, basically, or the reverberation time. 
Um, and this is how long it takes for a sound to drop from 60 decibels to zero um, over a space. And the longer the reverberation time, the harder it is to understand you. So for example, York Minster or big churches tend to have really long reverberation times. So York Minster is about seven seconds, um, which means it's really well suited for like organ music, music where you want the sounds to project for a long time. Whereas um, shorter length uh, time, it gets more, it gets better for you to understand public speaking. For example, a one second reverberation time is usually perfect. This is a little bit longer because you can hear me echoing around the space. My voice isn't just cutting off as soon as I finish. Um, and this was all because of, he, he kind of, he did a lot of research and this turned out to be the base, based on what the surface properties of the room, rooms are. So for, the reason this room is really working well for projecting my voice is it's very, very reflective. All the surfaces are hard. Uh, the picture I've got in front of you is uh, the anechoic chamber on your right hand side um, and the reflectance chamber at the University of Southampton. Uh, the anechoic chamber is a dead room. It is designed so there is no reverberation in it. It's a very strange space. You get a bit confused in there because you get shut into a room where you can't hear your footprints and stuff. Uh, and the other, and the reflectance chamber does the opposite. And the point is you can record sounds in these spaces ready to process for different things. Um, and, and also reverberation. It'll also have an impact on like the size of the space you're in as well. So uh, there's the diagram of what reverberation time is and how broadly it's calculated. Uh, early decay time is another numerical value that we can use to kind of assess the acoustical properties of a space. Um, what I think makes my work quite different from Stuart Eves is that he's trying to really engage with how people experience. I am very interested in that, but I'm also interested in uh, the kind of numerical values or the numerical, the, the ways we can assess these spaces on a more kind of, I'm not going to use the word objective either because that's a naughty word, uh, but kind of different ways of kind of quantifying the experience of a space because I kind of feel that you can't have one without the other. You can't make comments about someone's experience in the past because that's a very personal experience based on a whole different range of things. Um, but equally, I don't think you can just use a number either because that takes a lot of the feeling out of it. It takes a lot of the kind of understanding. And I think you need to be looking at kind of both responses. Uh, so modeling acoustics, how do we model acoustics? Um, well, we rec can record acoustical properties which is what's going on here. So basically your laptop sends out a single to an amplifier which goes out to a source, so a speaker of some description. That excites the room, the sound is excited by the kind of space, um, so like I just explained, surface properties and things, how it's um, reflected or absorbed. And then the signal is received at the other end and then that goes back into the computer. And that's how you get your beautiful images of sound waves. Um, but we can also create oralizations as well. So we can either use the recording that I just discussed, so that's the room impulse response. So that's what comes out at the other end of your receiver. Um, and you can combine this with an anechoic recording. So when you went into the dead room and recorded, for example, we recorded just me saying a few sentences, but you could also, for example, put in a string quartet or a musician or something like that, and record in that dead space. And then you can convolve the sounds, so combine the signal of your room with the recording that has been undertaken without any impact from the space you're in and put that out to create an oralization, which is very nice. Uh, so my case study is item moat. Uh, item moat, if you're not British or you don't know National Trust places very well, is in Kent, which is here. It is a 14th century um, manor house um, built in like the early 1300s rather than late 1300s. Um, it's one of the properties I worked at. Um, it's interesting because it was, um, well, it was the subject of a Time Team episode, but it was, a, it was restored for about 10 million pounds, which they basically completely took the entire timber frame part, mended it, and then put it all back together in exactly the same way. So there's an awful lot known about it, and it's been studied in a whole range of ways. So, one of the things about my oralizations and what I'm trying to say with the sound is that we're trying to think about how these, um, how the building can be conceived of in a different way, a non-visual way. And here are just a series of the ways that people have understood the space visually. So for example, we've got like standard elevation drawings. We've got a little bit of a 3D model going on up there. We've got some floor plans. Uh, and then we've got two different techniques which have been implemented a lot in the medieval studies. So we've got access analysis and planning analysis, which 
um, just let us kind of lay the space out in a slightly different way, but it's more experiential than necessarily a standard visualisation. Um, here are some photographs of the space we used. Uh, we ended up, uh, we went along for a night and we did the acoustic recording there. Um, and we actually did, we recorded the acoustics of three spaces, but this is the one we ended up focusing on. This is the Great Hall. Um, I chose this space particularly because it has been altered quite a lot since the medieval period. Um, what you're looking at now is actually quite a Victorian space. The wooden panelling was inserted in the 1800s. That perpendicular window was a later insertion as well. But the roof remains the same and the general space itself has not been altered that much. So it's just the surface properties that have been altered and changed and that's why we can go in and do the recording and use it in the same way we would use, uh, say for example, a total station survey or a photogrammetric model to kind of start to create a visualisation or something like that. In this case, we can use it to kind of pull apart the acoustical properties of the space as it might have been in the past. Uh, so here's our recording equipment. This is, um, we actually use three different types of microphone in the end. We use a normal microphone, the round one, that's a omnidirectional microphone, so the sound was recorded from all different directions. So we could start to pull apart where what was reflecting from different sides. The other one is a Keymanan, which is not quite the same as naan bread, and it means that you can do directionality, so you, you can move around and you'll hear things from different sides. So if I was to give you the binaural recording and you could listen to it through your headphones, you could say the sound was coming from the left or right or behind or in front of you. Um, Modelling. So, as I said before, the space has changed and we can't just use the recording because it doesn't quite work like that. Instead, we have to think about how the space has changed and what things we need to change within that space. So, my methodology is fairly similar to a visualisation. I started with the space as it stands today, give or take. Um, the software isn't quite as developed as I thought it was, so you have to model in panels, which means you, have to, you can't quite do the roof very well, but it's a work in progress. Um, you start with the space as it stands today, uh, including the surface properties and everything like that. So we used a total station to record those, that, that space. Um, and then you can um, adjust the model according to different things. So for example, you can use the recording to kind of tweak it to make it sound exactly as the room sounded today. And then you can take away different properties and change them for other things. So you're using it to, um, to oh, I've lost that word, just adjust it, so I tweak it, if you will before you then start considering how it would have looked or sounded or been like at a different period. Uh, we went into record at the anechoic chamber, so there's a nice photo of me, looking a bit confused. Um, and uh, we ended up creating two different models for the space. We created the Great Hall as it is today, um, and the Great Hall as it could have been in the 14th century. Um, what you need to kind of consider about this before you um, uh, I don't have the right microphone or headphones for this, so what I'm asking you to hear here is like a slight a change in the two uh, oralizations rather than um, exactly what they sound like, if that makes sense. This is great for what I think of the Senate government. It's one of the oldest areas in the building, which is in the end of the century. Okay. This is great for what I think of the Senate government. It's one of the oldest areas in the building, which is in the end of the century. So obviously it sounded quite different. Uh, the second one sounded significantly more muffled and that's because of changing surface properties because um, that space would have tended to have a lot more hangings and tap, well not tapestries, but wall hangings to kind of, which would mute the space. Um, so we also did a comparison between the numerical parameters as well. Um, and as you can see, the, the lines come out different, basically. Uh, the measured is the one we're interested in here. Um, as that's what came out from the model, um, and that was a, a much lower frequency, and a, a, sorry, not lower frequency, and much lower early decay time than the other one, which had a peak at the low end of the spectrum. And the same with the reverberation time. And I've got to speed up because I have naturally talked too long again. Uh, I also ran a series of listening tests. So as I said, I wanted to do more than just. Uh, discuss the numerical values and those things. I want to discuss how people heard these things and what they heard about them. So I was comparing different uh, frequencies here. And it was interesting to see how the shift in um, uh, responses changed as we uh, altered the model in different ways. And um, we did the same with reverberation time. Anyway, so what this told me, um, 
The reverberation time came out about one second across most of the hall. We used multiple points across the hall because if you know anything about medieval buildings, um, you'll know that there, there's a very kind of set way in how they were used that's based on people's class. Um, so we chose a number of recording points and receiving points from across that space. And it was very, very consistent at coming out at about one second. Um, what one second means is the space wasn't naturally suited towards music. Um, nor was it particularly well suited to private conversation. It was more of a public speaking space. Um, you tend to lower it a bit if you think the hall was full, which means it was then tended to be better suited for private conversation, not public speaking. This is interesting because it can start us to question how people were using this space in the past. There's a whole, um, I'm going to use a pop culture example because I think that's how most people understand the medieval period, particularly in great halls. Um, when you think of a great hall, you often think of the Game of Thrones great hall, with people getting drunk and lots of loud noise and singing and dancing and music. Um, or you can think of what the example I have here, which is a Knight's Tale, with lots of formal dancing. Um, but actually, if that space isn't suited that well to those music and those things being heard, then this can make, help us start asking more questions about how the experience of that space, what the experience of that space is, and if it's more suited towards a quiet environment. I spoke to a historian at the University of Southampton who specialises in great halls, Professor Chris Woolger, and he disagreed with everything I said, purely because his reading of, his historian, uh, his reading of all the documents suggested that actually great halls were very silent spaces. They were celebrated for being very, very formal and very, very quiet. And actually, I don't think even that's true. I think that there's enough reverberation in there to make that really, really difficult. So I think it begins to open us up, up to more questions about how we're thinking about this space in terms of what you're hearing rather than what you're seeing. Um, and towards a lived experience beyond just the use of space. How can we take this further? Um, well, actually, I've been arguing about why we should do sounds, but I've actually been doing it in a very oral-centric manner instead of an ocular-centric manner, as we would do in uh, a visualisation. We critique visualisations for being silent, for being intangible, for not being engaging. But actually, um, I'm doing exactly the same here by not including a visual element to my oralizations. Um, so I did do a few tests as part of my thesis, which I can talk to anyone more about if they're interested. But my point is more that we need to be taking the next steps and considering how we can use this information in combination with a more sensory, like, wide engagement. So whether this is approaching this through using um, uh, Oculus Rifts or things like that, or doing this in other ways. I'm just about to start a project on virtual St. Stephen's and doing the acoustical modelling for that as, part, as, as a critique that they felt that um, the beautiful, beautiful images they'd created were not enough. They needed some kind of sound to make them more engaging, make them more fulfilling. Anyway, I'm sorry, I don't know if that was a bit garbled. It's a slightly different presentation to normal, so thank you very much.